Hello, good day, and welcome back to Go on the Run. And today, we're going to continue looking at pocket-based, but specifically now, we're going to look at the users collection. I'm going to focus on adding users and then how you can log in or authenticate with those users to get their authentication token, which you can then use to do other things. So I'm going to pick up exactly where we left off, and I'm going to start my pocket base. And so in our previous um, work, we had these um, items in our collection, but again, we're working with users. And we can see here in users, we don't have any users. Now, we didn't create the users collection, this came with it. But we can see we have all the set of things that we had before for our um, items collections, which are, you know, list search, list slash search, you know, view, and then create, update, delete, and then this real time, which we're going to ignore for now. And then you have some other ones which make sense for users, which is being able to authenticate. And Pocketbase provide many other ways to, to authenticate a user, including um, you know, username and password, or with OAuth 2, which is where you can tie into existing OAuth providers like Google, Facebook, Microsoft Azure, AWS, all those other sort of thing, Twitter, and so on. Of course, password reset, confirm a password. These are all things that if you had to build it out, it would be quite a bit of work, but then you get it out of the box with um, pocket base. So the first one, of course, is being able to get a list of users. And you can see here it's slash API slash collections slash users. And that's because users is a collection. So it's right there in the collection um, endpoint and subgroup. And so then you can call records. So let's do that. So we're going to do HTTPIE and as before, we're going to our local host, which is 8090 slash API slash collections slash users and then records. And if we press enter, we'll see that we get back 200. OK, so it wasn't an error, but notice we didn't see any users, which makes sense. We don't have any yet. Um, you can, of course, use curl for this. Now, I want to show you something really, really quickly. And that is another way of being able to execute RESTful command. Now, I say I love using HTTPIE, and I do. I love using the command line. But I use that for quick things. But when I was working, or if you work in a group where you're developing endpoints, your team might be using something like Postman or something like that. And um, those allow you to share um, you know, these sort of requests, so you don't have to keep writing them and going back to your command line. Um, another tool that I use on my computer is called um, Insomnia. I've been using it for a while. And so what you can do is download Insomnia. You can get the free version. There's also a free version for Postman. And so with Insomnia install, what you can do then is just say, I want to create like a new HTTP request. And here by default, it goes to get. But of course, here you have all the other methods that you can change. And so let's just try that. And we can say HTTP colon for slash local host colon 8090 slash API slash collections slash user slash records. And we can click on send. And you can see we get the same result here. And of course, if we were doing something more interesting, like a post or something, we can do that. And then set here under the post body, we have the request parameters. It's all nicely laid out with these tabs. Um, Postman and Insomnia are not the only ones. There's also Opscotch. I tried Opscotch when it was very, very new. Honestly, I haven't, I still don't have it installed anymore. And it might still be, you know, it might still be a really good option. So you have all these other ones. The nice thing that they have is the ability to be able to um, create your requests, put them into collections, create environments. You can save them with your colleagues and all this other stuff. They have their own custom format for saving this information. So you can then put it in like a Git repository and stuff, or you might if I pay for an online account where you can log in and your colleague can share things. All great and enterprise features, but here's the thing. Most of us don't need that. So what I like, and I'm, so I'm gonna get rid of um, Insomnia you now. And what I prefer actually, I like a lot, is to be able to my, use my VS Code editor to save my request as text file because they can be connect, committed with the code and other developers can access it and see it and modify it and change it the same way as if they're using one of these graphical tools where they'll have to still save it to back to 
the repository anyway. So how do I use this? Let me show you here. I am in episode three. I don't have anything. So let's bring up our Codium. In Codium is a plugin called REST Client. And so you can just go to plugins and look for REST Client. And this works regardless if you're using VS Code or actual Codium. And so I'm using this one. And um, if you just do a quick scan of the features and how to use it, you see there's quite a bit. What's really interesting is you can get more information by going to this link here, where is this request for comment 2616 that this is based off of. And so let's just jump right in. So today we're going to be playing with users, um, the user API. So let's just say that oh, we can call this file user, HTTP, um, user API. And the extension you can use is HTTP. And once you use this extension, notice what happened. Um, once you have the plugin installed, it doesn't look like anything happened, but something has changed. And what you can, oh, you can see this very easily is if we say, let's just get the list of users. So locally, we want to do HTTP colon. And notice when I start typing what I have, send request. And that's what I mean by something has changed because we have this plugin that re recognizes that HTTP endpoint, um, the HTTP um, extension on this text file. And so I can say local host colon 8090 slash API slash collections slash users slash records. Okay. And now I can just say, click on the send button and notice we got the same thing from the command line. Notice I didn't even have to type, you know, like get or anything, but I could, if I want to, and that's what I prefer to do is to be explicit. So as much as I love using HTTP in the command line, I do that for really quick things that I don't care about recording. But if I want to share something with someone, I like I'm going to commit this to the repository so you're going to have this. So now I like to do this. And even more interesting is that you can do things like commenting. So I can say, like, um, here's a comment. I can say, get, you know, get all users. All right. So I'm not going to try and teach you everything about um, this um, RFC 2616, please go read it, check it out if you want to use this. Otherwise, stick to the command line or use a graphical client. Whatever you decide to use, you should spend the time learning how to use it. So this is not a tutorial. So let's continue. So I tried to get the list of users. Okay, that's fine. So let's go back now to our um, endpoint here, documentation for users, and we want to create a user. And so we can see from this, we just have to send something to this endpoint, the post, do a post, the same endpoint where we did a get, and the thing and the fields that are required are just, you know, the password and the password confirmation. Makes sense. If you're going to ask users to create a password, you've seen this before, we ask them to confirm the password. So just those two fields. Username is not required. It's just a string, and it would be automatically generated if not provided. Email is also not required. And so let's just try this. So let's go back here and we'll just do paste this and let's do HTTP colon for slash local host colon 8080 80, 80, 90. And there we go. And then we want to send what? We want to send a JSON record and you can do that right here. And it says password and password confirm. So let's do, okay, let's just type password. Okay, that looks good enough. And so what happens now? Why don't I have a send above post so I can just send this post alone? Well, again, I don't want to spend too much time teaching you this, but basically the way this works, if you click send here, it does the get and then the post. If you want to make them separate requests, what you have to do is separate them by this triple, um, hash for um, a comment. A single hash is also a comment, but they have different meaning and double hash. So spend time reading the documentation. So let's do create a user. Okay. And now let's hit the send. And notice here it says fail to load the submitted data due to invalid formatting. And that's because unlike HTTPA in a command line, when I do a post, I need to say what kind of body I'm sending. So I can specify that here by saying content type and I can say application JSON, okay? And now, if I click send, notice how oh, it created a user, and notice how oh, the username 
just says users, blah, blah, blah. And again, that was auto generated. But other than that, we have cre successfully created a user. And we can go back to our API, to our UI, refresh, and there is our new user that we created from um, this RESTful endpoint. Notice how our endpoint for creating user is open, which means that anybody can create a user account. Now, this user is not verified. I'm not going to spend time explaining all that, but you could figure out what it means um, based on other places where you would have created a account. So you could still set up that sort of thing. You can lock it down so that only admin can create a account, whatever. But at least we know how if we create an application, users can at least register themselves. All right. So what if we wanted to create yet another user? Well, before I continue, um, let's look at this. We're repeating this over and over, right? Like I can easily just say, you know, do something like this and say, create a third user, right? Another user, for example, and, you know, put in the information for that user. Um, maybe we want that user to be, to have the username um, John Doe. So username, and maybe we want to set their email at the same time. Okay, great, but we, we're repeating things. So one of the nice thing about using, putting things in um, a tool like this, whether it's graphical or this specific text one, is that you can create a variable. So I can say um, something like URL or base URL. And then I can say at base URL equals, and then I can say it's equals to HTTP colon slash local host colon 8090 collections. And so now notice how it says zero reference because this is now seen as a variable. So I can then replace all these places where I have this bit by referring to this variable. And using the variable is simply a matter of saying base URL. And notice how it showed up there like that just now. It enclosed it in double um, curly braces. And now we see three references because it's being referred to three times. And so now I can send my request this way. And there we go. John Doe, the user, was created. And once again, if we go back to our endpoint, to our UI, and we refresh, we have that user. Okay, so now we have users created, and this is great. Now, there's one thing I want to tell you about this file format that you have to be careful with, and that is you do not want to enclose this in a string. It really takes this as a literal value. So if you try to create a record, or if you try to send a request like a post where you put this as double quote, you might think it's the same, but it's not. So be careful with that. Um, that's the only, some of the caveat, caveat about this, using this file is how it treats strings. All right. So now that we have users, what else can we do? Let's go take a look. So with our users, we can, of course, update and delete. And I'm not going to spend time doing that because you can do that. But the interesting one is now that we have users, they can authenticate. And so we can authenticate with a username and password or email and password. You see, username or email. And then the password. And we're simply going to do a post to the endpoint called auth with password. And that's all we have to do. And let's copy that. And um, then we have to send in the body identity and password. So let's just go try and authenticate. So I'm going to say login or auth with username and password. We do this and then we see base URL variable, use that. And like I said, we want to make sure that we say content type because if we don't set a content type, it's not going to work. It's going to be confused about the format. And we want to do application JSON and, no, and do not enclose it as a string. Then here is our JSON that we want to send. It says we have to send identity and password. Now, I didn't show this or mention it earlier, but um, PocketBase is already set up with the minimum password size. And it just so happened to be the minimum has to be eight characters up to 72 characters. But you can change all of that. So the default is more than enough. So unless you want to make it more stringent, but I said don't definitely don't lower it. So, OK, so we have this. And so let's send our request to login. And it says um, not found. What was not found? John Doe? Well, we know the user John Doe should be there. And, oh, this is wrong. <laughs> um, I really don't need to put all of this. I just need to do this. 
So, yep, was our URL that was wrong. So now we send this and bam, our user successfully logged in 200. Okay, notice how we get back information about the user. If that um, name and everything, we can use that when the user log in, their email address. And now we have most importantly, the JWT, which we can then use to do other things. So I'm going to highlight the JWT and copy it. Notice we didn't have to do anything but implementing JWT and all that good stuff, right? Now, let's exploit the fact that oh, we, we can use variables. So we're going to say, after we got a JWT, we'll say, okay, let's um, use a variable here. So let's do this to separate the next request. But really, it's not another request. It's more like, instead of variable, save JWT. Now, there's a way in which when you send a request, you can say that it should pull out from the response the token and like save it. But I don't want to spend time doing all that good stuff. So we want to save our JWT and let's save it like this. Now notice I'm not enclosing it in a, as a string because it's already treated as a string. If I put enclose it, when it sends it, it's going to try to enclose it again and it's going to be wrong. So that's our token that we have. And now let's try and do another get. And so let's see what happens when we do a get. Now, when we do a get, I'm going to send this. Notice how it says no users, but that's not true because we do have users. The reason that we're getting no users or we're getting back an empty list is because we are not authenticated. Yes, we just logged in and we get our JWT, but we're not sending that. So now we need to send our request using our authenticated token. The thing we're going to use is the authorization header. And there's a special value that you have to use. And so one way in which you can know how to, what you have to send here is to go back to the documentation. And if we click on user of API preview, and then we look at something like, if you had to do something like authentication refresh, you have to already be logged in. And so as you can see, this endpoint call requires that you have authorization um, header, right? So with that, we can then go um, back here and we can say, oh, we need to send the bearer token. Bearer is when you're using like JWT. And then of course, if we put token and we can see that's a variable and we enclose, we do enter and notice how it's enclosed it. And now, of course, if we over over it, we see the value. But now when we send the same get request, notice what happened. We get back our information, which makes sense. If I am requesting a list of users, why should I see all the users on the system unless the endpoints allow me, uh, unless the endpoint allow that, okay? And so without going into too much detail about how the endpoint is configured for users, we can go here and go to API rules, and we can see that for listing, it says, basically filter the results to be the ID of the person who is requesting it. So when you are making the request, PocketBase is going to validate your JWT and set in their request auth, that ID, your user ID. So the only record that gets sent back in this listing is our records that matches the authenticated user ID. And so since you only have one um, user account with that ID, you get, you see one and same thing with view. You can only see your specific, um, record. Now create is left open for anyone. Of course, we can set it to admin only. And you can see update is set specifically for again, authenticated user and delete. So there's, this is why when we did the listing, we weren't seeing anything. And now that we've authenticated, we can only see our record. We're going to get in more into these rules uh, and how you specify them in another video. But at least for this video, I want to end here. And what did we do? We create a new user. We have to list our own user. We have to do a login. Now, I'm not going to go through delete and update because we've seen that for items. So it works essentially the same way. It's just a different endpoint. Once again, thanks for coming. Thanks for watching the video. Thanks for your patience. If you are a new subscriber, please consider subscribing. I'd love to have you. If you're a returning subscriber, um, thank you for coming back. And thank you, Mikhail, for being a Patreon subscriber. If you want to be like Mikhail, here are some of the ways that though, you can contribute to the channel. Take care, stay safe, and see you in the next video. Bye.